So my name is Alina Schwarz. I'm the editorial assistant of the World Stroke Academy and will be hosting this webinar today for the World Stroke Organization. And our topic today is COVID-19 and stroke in Asia. We are very honored to have three fantastic speakers with us. Professor Diraj Kurana, and then we have Assistant Professor Carol Tam and Associate Professor Deidre De Silva with us today. And before we start, I'd just like to do a little housekeeping. So during the session, if you have any questions, please type them into, your, uh, into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your Zoom. And what we'll do is we'll bring them up during the discussion at the end of this webinar. And for this, we also have a special guest, Professor Peter Sandako, and he's Emeritus Professor of Medical Neurology at the University of Edinburgh and Lead Commissioning Editor of the World Stroke Academy. Um, so I'd now like to introduce our first speaker who will talk about the important topic, planning acute stroke interventions in COVID times. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Carol Tam. She's a consultant stroke neurologist at the National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore and adjunct assistant professor at Duke NUS Medical School. She received her specialist training in neurology in Singapore and subsequently completed a clinical fellowship in stroke with the Calgary Stroke Program in Canada. And her clinical and research interests are in hyperacute stroke treatment, stroke in young adults and stroke genetics. Over to you, Carol, and welcome. Thank you, thank you Alina for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invite to speak at this uh, webinar. Um, I'm just going to share my slides now. So the topic I'm going to be covering is uh, planning acute stroke interventions uh, in COVID times. Uh, so particularly our experience uh, at the uh, National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore. Okay, I have uh, no disclosures to make. Okay, so the current COVID situation as of yesterday, when I was finalizing my slides, um, were that there are 3.76 million cases worldwide with 264,000 deaths, and uh, there were 20,939 cases of uh, confirmed COVID uh, patients in Singapore uh, with 20 deaths. Um, we know that COVID is a highly uh, infectious virus and uh, it has uh, taken a huge impact on our healthcare resources. So in uh, Singapore, we have a hub and spoke model for stroke. Uh, my center is a hyperacute stroke center with uh, EVT capabilities. Um, and at my center, we see 1,800 stroke cases a year. Uh, we are also the hub for uh, two spokes um, in Singapore. And um, prior to uh, the COVID time, uh, we were actually practicing the uh, diversion uh, uh, process where uh, ambulances who pick up uh, acute stroke patients um, in the vicinity of the primary stroke centers, they would bypass the stroke primary stroke centers and send the patients uh, directly to the hyperacute stroke center. Um, because Singapore is actually quite a small country and um, our, the distance from the spoke to our hyperacute stroke center is actually less than 30 minutes uh, by ambulance. Um, however, there are still patients who would actually walk in uh, to the primary stroke centers and then uh, we actually do telemedicine uh, for these cases, uh, give TPA in the primary stroke center and then transfer the patients uh, for endovascular therapy. So there are, I think, three main aims uh, during uh, this COVID times. Uh, uh, firstly, we want to ensure the safety of uh, all the healthcare personnel attending uh, to patients. Uh, secondly, we still want to maintain good door-to-needle times for TPA and endovascular therapy. And thirdly, we still want to maintain good outcomes for stroke patients, uh, despite all the additional precautions that we have needed to take. So I think we have faced these uh, six main challenges um, over the past few months um, since we start, first started having COVID uh, cases in Singapore. Um, we, we've start, we started having it since the end of January till now. And uh, along the way, um, we have made many modifications to our protocols and um, come up with uh, many new challenges. Almost every other week, uh, there, there is a new challenge that comes up. So I think, firstly, the biggest challenge is uh, time. Because as we know, in an acute stroke, uh, time is critical. And um, as we have heard, uh, every minute delay results in 1.9 million uh, neurons uh, uh, getting damaged. And um, in an acute stroke, um, 
you know, we have that hourglass in our mind ticking away and we, and we know that um, every minute that we delay further, um, the patient doesn't do well. But um, there are a few things that, uh, that happen during COVID times that uh, result in delays. So for example, we need to don personal protective equipment. And as we know, wearing the N95 mask, the goggles, the, the uh, gowns and gloves, that takes up precious few minutes. And then the additional questions that we now need to ask to ascertain uh, the patient's COVID risk to determine where we are going to scan the patient, um, all these take up precious time. The next challenge is uncertain history. Most of our stroke patients are either dysarthric or uh, some may be aphasic. And sometimes it may be difficult to ascertain uh, whether they have had respiratory symptoms or they have had fever um, in the few days prior to admission. Sometimes the family is not around. With all the added uh, precautions, uh, family members are not allowed to come into the emergency department uh, with the patient. Sometimes they're made to wait outside. It's not easy to get the history. The third challenge would be uh, movement. Um, the patients uh, in an acute stroke, hyperacute stroke situation require transport from one location to another. So from the emergency department to the CT scan, to the angel suite, to ICU. And all that movement uh, requires coordination, especially if the patient is a COVID suspect. Uh, we need to um, ensure that we don't cross-contaminate other patients who may come across their path. Uh, the next challenge is that multiple disciplines are involved. It's not just confined to neurologists. We have to work with the A&E doctors, the interventional neuroradiologists, the anesthetists, the intensivists. So any change uh, we make to the protocols need to go out to all these uh, specialists. And um, limited resources. So as we, as we have seen, um, the, the large number of COVID patients uh, definitely takes a toll on the manpower and uh, our ICU beds, um, which um, in an acute stroke situation actually we involve um, usually a lot of manpower with our nurse, stroke nurses and neurologists. And also uh, most of our patients usually get monitored in a, a high dependency or ICU bed situation. Um, <clears throat> with the limited resources, um, this, this, will be, this will need to be taken into account as well. And then finally, I think this might be one of the biggest challenges is the constantly changing situation. So where we have to keep changing our protocols, I think we are at, we have changed our protocols more than 10 times really since the, the COVID situation started uh, based on the latest information uh, we've received and also the resources that we have. So I'll just take you um, kind of step by step through what we've done. So at the pre-notification stage, um, Previously, uh, during pre-COVID times, the paramedics would actually pre-notify us of an acute stroke case coming into the emergency department. Um, and now they would have to add on a notification about whether there's fever, respiratory symptoms, and travel history, so that the patients can then be appropriately triaged to either the normal areas of the emergency department or an isolation area. And then within the emergency department itself, um, all our healthcare personnel actually wear um, the, the full personal protective equipment, meaning full sleeve gowns, N95 masks, uh, eye goggles or visors, head covering and gloves. So this is even if the paramedics did not identify um, fever, respiratory symptoms or significant travel history, uh, because we recognize that um, in the limited time the paramedics have, they might not have gotten the full history. So to ensure protection and safety of all our healthcare personnel, uh, we attend to all our acute stroke activations in uh, full personal protective equipment until further definitive history can be obtained from the patient or the families. Then uh, when we send our patients for neuroimaging, uh, we have a separate designated uh, CT scanner for COVID suspect cases um, and we ensure thorough cleaning after each COVID suspect case. Um, this is to reduce the risk of cross-contamination between suspect and non-suspect cases. Uh, we've also taken uh, some precautions uh, for our radiographers. For example, they are now rostered in a separate designated shifts. Um, so they are divided into groups and um, that particular group of radiographers will uh, stay together in the same shift all the time and will not intermingle with um, radiographers from another shift uh, to prevent uh, cross-infection if one of the radiographers is, uh, is down with COVID. And for non-suspect cases, um, all the radiographers will wear at least a surgical mask um, just in case there is uh, transient contact with um, a patient who initially is non-suspect but later turns out to be a suspect case. Um, also uh, for COVID suspect cases, they are then in the full PPE. So this to protect our radiographers and to also ensure continuity of function in the department. 
Okay. When the patients uh, do need endovascular therapy, our interventional neuroradiologists now have to perform all endovascular thrombectomy cases in a full PPE, meaning the gown, N95 mask, eye goggles and gloves, uh, regardless of whether the patient is a COVID suspect or, or not a COVID suspect. Um, this is because uh, with COVID, it, uh, it's been very tricky. Like there are patients who come in uh, without uh, significant fever or respiratory symptoms um, and chest x-ray uh, then does not show any pneumonia. But later on, uh, they develop these symptoms or someone, um, some family member comes along and says, oh, they do recall that, oh, the patient did actually have some respiratory symptoms and turns out um, the patient may be a COVID uh, suspect case eventually. So because of that, and because our interventional neuroradiologists, they do have a prolonged contact time uh, with the patients. Uh, usually an uh, endovascular thrombectomy case can take like up to an hour where the neuroradiologist is with the with the patient in uh, close proximity. So to mitigate this risk of being exposed to a possible um, a case that may possibly turn out to be um, positive for COVID, um, they've taken this precaution of wearing full PPE. Um, as we know also, interventional neuroradiologists are in very limited uh, supply. They are very precious uh, resource that we, um, we cannot afford to let any of them get infected. And then uh, secondly, we have also implemented a controlled intubation of all COVID suspect cases uh, prior to EVT um, in a separate room with a segregated ventilation system and negative pressure. Um, this is because if a patient um, suddenly goes into respiratory distress midway through the endovascular therapy uh, procedure, if we were to then intubate that patient, it will risk um, generating uh, aerosols and um, it would be, it would uh, put everyone in the angel suite at greater risk. So uh, next, um, so post TPA or EVT, um, right sighting of the patients is also important. So for the COVID suspect cases, we actually send them now to a multidisciplinary um, ICU, uh, isolation room ICU, and where they are managed by both intensivists and neurologists so that they receive the best care for both the stroke and the COVID part. And we've also made some contingency plans in the event that um, our ICU or high D beds are in shortage. So we've come up with some uh, protocols where patients who are deemed to be at lower risk of post-TPA complications uh, can be monitored in a general ward setting rather than a high dependency. Uh, thankfully, we have not needed to use this contingency plans yet, uh, but some things we considered were the age, um, if they had low NIHSS, lacuna syndromes, no large vessel occlusion, and uh, they were not requiring IV antihypertensives to maintain their blood pressure post-TPA, um, then we would consider sending these patients straight away to a general ward instead of uh, monitoring them in a high dependency. Uh, for transport, uh, we have designated transport routes with um, a security escort who would uh, clear the path uh, when the patient is moving from one location to another, if it's a COVID suspect case. And we also um, have put up clear signages to in indicate uh, the designated route that a COVID suspect patient should take uh, to reduce the risk of uh, cross-contamination uh, and transmission to other uh, non-suspect patients. And so for the hub and spoke model, um, to try and reduce the transfer, uh, in, inter-hospital transfers, uh, we've implemented the telemedicine consult for patients who come into our spokes and um, we, the patient will receive TPA and be managed in the spoke. Um, only if the patient requires endovascular therapy, then they are still transferred over. Um, if the patient um, has any suspicion for being a COVID suspect case, we'll also do a chest uh, radiograph on them before transferring. So um, in conclusion, um, I think these four main things uh, are, are the most important during this time. So safety is of the top priority, safety of um, all the healthcare personnel involved. And uh, communication is very important, ensuring everyone on the team uh, knows what to do, what the latest protocol is. We've started, uh, Tiger, uh, we've started like this uh, chat uh, uh, group so that everyone is uh, updated on the latest. And then uh, audits, I think, are very important as well. To, um, to check whether everyone is adhering to the protocols, as well as um, to monitor the door-to-needle times uh, to ensure that these timings are not uh, increasing. And then um, modifications are also important because as we go along, as we learn more about COVID, um, and as we detect problems along the way, uh, we need to keep modifying our proto uh, protocols um, to ensure that we maintain uh, high standards of care.
So these are some references and resources. So um, we've actually written up um, what, what we've done um, over the past few months uh, into a paper, uh, challenges in adapting existing hyperacute stroke protocols um, in Singapore. And then um, the, the next reference, Protected Code Stroke During the COVID-19 Pandemic by the uh, Canadian group, uh, that has also been very useful, very helpful information there. And then um, there's also been uh, guidance from the US, UK, Canada, and um, Australia um, society, stroke societies on um, things to look out for during COVID-19. Okay, with that, um, I shall end here and uh, I'd like to thank all the members of our Coach Stroke team who have been working tirelessly during this time. And uh, I'd like to end with a quote by Victor Hugo, even the darkest night will end and the sun will rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for these really interesting insights and we'll make sure to add the resources and the references to the WSL homepage together with this video so you can all access them. Um, so the topic, so let's just move on to our next topic and our next speaker. Um, and that's COVID-19 and stroke perspective from an Indian hotspot. For this, we welcome Dr. Dhiraj Kurana, Professor at the Department of Neurology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research in Chandigarh in India, where he's in charge of the stroke program. And Professor Kurana is the National Coordinator for the SITS India Stroke Registry and has been involved in a number of large multinational clinical trials and a research in the areas of stroke thrombolysis, stroke systems of care, and most recently, telestroke and neurorehabilitation. Over to you, Diraj. Yeah. Uh, is it visible? Yeah. Uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone in different parts of the world. Uh, I believe it's close to evening in Singapore, though. Uh, as, as far as COVID-19 and stroke, is concerned, we, we're hearing uh, all the concerns across the world, which are quite similar. And in India, as of now, uh, my city, Chandigarh, India is a, uh, it's, 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 it's quite a vast country, as you are aware, in different areas of a different uh, distribution currently. Chandigarh, right now, uh, does not have a very high number, but we anticipate there may be a high number coming up in the next few days. Our lockdown just opened three days back, three or four days back. And we are seeing a slight big rush, at least in Chandigarh and the other states like Maharashtra, there's been a big explosion of patients. And there's a big concern and they're actually now, the government is asking doctors who are not employed with the government to join up and they've actually been given a, a kind of a whip to join the government services. And uh, in cities like Gurgaon, which is close to Delhi, uh, certain hospitals have been taken over by the government since the number of beds which they needed for the ICU, they've come down. So uh, right now, a hot spot is a, they're, they're, we have divided India into three zones, red, green, and orange. And red is a hot spot or a red zone where you have still a number of. So going by the latest figures, this is the CSSC graph. The early morning today, we are almost reaching close to 4 million patients, as you can see across the world. And in India, if we see, we are reaching, we have just exceeded 50,000 patients. And uh, this, this may rise in the coming days. So as far as stroke is concerned, I'm just not going to go into details, but something which has recently, which, which was initially a big concern, uh, is the cause of the stroke post-COVID. I think this is important for us to understand why it's happening. There are still postulates for that, for the systemic inflammation leading on to increased reactive oxygen species, as well as other prothrombotic states. But where is a prothrombotic state? We still don't know. There is a coagulopathy for sure. And uh, it's, it's been found that patients either have a cytokine storm, there's a DVT and PE, which is more prominent. And this study, which I quote, is, is quite, quite uh, I would say, insightful, which just got published in the morning today. Uh, I saw it in the morning. Now, this autopsy of the largest number of uh, patients, of 12 patients, shows DVD in, in a big majority of patients and leading on to pulmonary embolism, causing the death, which clearly indicates that there's something else which is happening, and maybe the strokes are also part of the thromboembolism. And this also uh, provides us insight into 
giving treatment with antithrombotics in these patients. So stroke in 2020 is a changed picture, we all know, and stroke care has completely changed the era. The same thing which uh, uh, Carol just mentioned, there are changes happening in the entire stroke pathways. Uh, the important part is uh, the world over, there's a reduction in the number of strokes and heart attacks which are coming to the hospitals and the neurologists now need to be protected. So what similar things are happening in India and we are going through changed neuroimaging test protocols. Now the biggest thing which is happening due to this is a delay which we don't want. Any delay we know is going to reduce the uh, outcomes, uh, it's going to deteriorate the outcomes. And the biggest problem, uh, again, as specified, uh, as mentioned in the last talk, we may not be able to know what exactly is happening. And there is a the, the distinction from neurological changes due to delirium or respiratory distress from focal changes uh, may not be distinguishable from that of a stroke. And most of, most of the time, you may not get a good medical history because patients may not be accompanied by the family members. And although uh, we, we are having members of uh, family in India, they do accompany, but now the uh, number of people who accompany the, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the patients, they, they, they come in limited numbers, but usually in India, we would have a good uh, rush of people coming with patients. So that's come down. Definitely people are quite aware. They are afraid of coming to the hospital and our hospital, which is a public sector hospital, is a COVID designate. And the government has uh, divided hospitals at COVID designate versus co hospitals which will take the other emergencies or COVID suspect. Uh, emergency. So we have a division between the hospitals in all the cities. Uh, in India, what has happened is, is a gross reduction in stroke admissions. And this was uh, initially we had a personal communication which we were publishing. And in PGI specifically, in, uh, in my hospital, we had an average reduction weekly by close to 75% in the number of strokes which are coming. And the, throm sorry, the thrombolysis rates have come down by 15%. And if I were to go by the uh, entire India's uh, figures, which we have, grossly, we have a reduction of 60 to 70% admissions to the ER, which is a big, big reduction and rates have reduced by 70%. Uh, I'll just show a graph, which has now just been accepted uh, in a publication, which is across the various centers, the major centers, which are, uh, which are from which we could get data. This has just been accepted in the New York Academy of Sciences paper, and uh, this week are getting an average of 60 to 70 percent of uh, number of patients, thrombosis, as well as around 50 percent reduction in thrombectomies across the country. Now, this is a significant reduction, and going by the burden of stroke which India has, this will lead on to uh, a major health uh, burden of stroke in the coming days. That's what we anticipate. On top of that, we have already overburdened emergency rooms and teams. There are screening difficulties, and there's been a big reduction, a big supply problem of PPEs and personal protective equipment. And uh, one of the major things is there still remains an emergency. We are trying to tell the administration, we are trying to tell people that acute stroke is still an emergency. We need to treat them like that. Uh, uh, the, COVID protocol, the stroke protocol has slightly changed as a protected stroke code that was just referred to. We are trying to, we, we have done certain changes in our protocol too. Uh, although COVID is not available to all our, uh, uh, PPE is not available to all our staff in the emergency. We are trying to get them level two protection. A surgical mask on the non-intubated patient, that's very important. And mask should remain on the patient during transportation from the emergency. So these are the things which uh, the stroke pathway that we've been able to achieve in various setups of what I've uh, known from the various parts of the country. The green pathway, most people are following separate pathways for stroke patients and they have been established in our uh, hospital too. In fact, we have two separate CD scans in the emergency and we are trying to now uh, label, uh, use them alternately so that if one CD scan gets used, even if that patient is a COVID suspect, <laughs> we can, uh, go on and clean that CD and get the next patient goes to the next CD. Now the problem in what we are facing in uh, some centers, especially in uh, PGI, 
all the COVID test back patients like strokes are not getting COVID testing despite we're trying to uh, convince our administration to get it done. There's a shortage of testing too. Uh, only till the time they have a strong suspicion they don't do a COVID test. So all strokes, they're going as a non-suspect. And that's the reason that's recommended in India that even if a non-suspect patient goes to a CT, you better clean the CT up even if you don't know. Because as COVID positive will go to a separate hospital, till that time, these patients uh, who are suspects will stay in the other facility. And that's happening in most, most places. So what we've been able to achieve is have a pre-designated CT facility. So a separate CT for COVID positive is definitely there, which is, which is a separate building. And pre-notification to CT facility. And CT test, test is being done for all our patients of stroke, which, which came in early since the early reports of stroke started coming up. And we're not using MRI as uh, rampantly as we were doing earlier. So as about Chandigarh, patients are more than, sorry, this is 150, not 15. And healthcare workers, the numbers are around 15, which have been infected in Chandigarh alone. Uh, we don't have numbers across the country. It would be a good idea. And uh, we should also know the healthcare workers who are getting infected. That should help us in planning our health systems. Uh, as far as total patients, we've had 28 patients from the time of the lockdown, as we called it in India, which was uh, 23rd of March till the current date. In PGI, we've had 28 patients. This is a drastic reduction for six weeks. Uh, average age, we've had a good number of young strokes coming up, in fact. Uh, and, and interestingly, we've had more hemorrhages in the younger patients, maybe different etiologies. Uh, a higher male percentage, higher ischemic, but hemorrhages have been quite frequently coming. And the time to reach the hospital has definitely increased. We are having patients reaching on an average of 270 minutes. And thrombolysis, dodonedal needle times have also increased despite having less rush. It's basically because of altered pathways and the fear and different other protocols which have been included in the treatment. Now, we had three patients who underwent from direct thrombectomies and three thromboluses. This includes one which we guided to in the Spoke Hospital in a community center. So we had around six. This is across, again, reduction in the number of patients that are being uh, treated in uh, hospitals like ours. And COVID testing had been done only in one of the patients, which uh, clearly speaks of the under-testing of the stroke patient which is happening in, in our country. And that too, because this patient had a fever uh, on the day two, three of the admission, and they were a uh, good number of uh, healthcare workers who got exposed. But luckily, she turned out to be negative. Uh, the other thing which has happened big time now is our understanding and our, uh, our introduction of telemedicine, which was never there in India. And fortunately, we've had new guidelines coming up allowing us. And so we, we were working on one of these uh, platforms, which we could rapidly uh, like, uh, use. And this was a stroke net Chandigarh, which is we've used for hub and spoke communication. This can basically give access to imaging to the entire team, as well as we can uh, communicate within the entire uh, team, as well as hub and spoke communication can be achieved. So we are trying to, we are working on this, we are improvising on this, uh, we are connecting hub and spokes. and. Uh, this, this, is, this was part of a new project, but it's coming handy right now. And so we, we anticipate that we're going to reduce total needle time as well as have reduced contact between teams. Uh, so this basically is for COVID unsuspected uh, patients, how we are dealing with them. We are still recommending full precautions and we have to give IVD as per guidelines, no change. Uh, I've already talked to this and post TPA, ideally what is recommended is to isolate them in a separate room before getting the COVID status and then to shift to appropriate wards. And if uh, now we have non-COVID hospitals, so what we are also suggesting to non-COVID hospitals that they should team up with stroke teams in the vicinity if they don't have a stroke team in their own hospital and try to facilitate stroke treatments by transferring to the nearest hospital because it may happen that the COVID negative or non-COVID hospital where the patient lands does not have a stroke team. Uh, the priority still remains is to provide early treatment. Uh, the statements, which are the, the one of the consensus statements by the Indian Stroke Association, which we just published recently. Uh, this, these are just the telemedicine changes which have happened. And we've had some recent guidelines, which actually allow uh, the doctors to use platforms like WhatsApp and other. Uh, but there are some, well, I could skip this, the challenges with telemedicine, which we need to, to overcome. 
basically what what will come in a big way and we are looking at this very rapidly there's an influx of telemedicine portals across the country people are utilizing it which was which was never there and i think any should wake up to telemedicine that's that's, uh, that's that's our understanding uh so this was one of the um, applications that we created for real early neuro rehab that's going to be used now for patients and this we just recently presented at the isc so this is also going to be useful in this current time and the best plan i believe is to allay anxiety of all people involved including healthcare workers and the patients by informing them of what uh, the best practices are staying safe we need to have we have all we have all established local guidelines and we should not wait for the covid test results that would be telling to everyone start treating these patients telemedicine is in a big way coming up and we need to have more telemedicine applications which can reduce contact with patients and still keep the efficiency and the designated roles and teams needs to be practiced because this is a new time and um, we are all experiencing this in new different times a new era so before i end i would like to really acknowledge the uh, involvement of our frontline nurses especially who are there working 24 hours tirelessly with these patients thank you thank you very much that's great Thank you. Um, and to all the viewers, if you have questions, you can start submitting them in the Q&A section in the panel. So moving on to our next talk, next and final talk, a warm welcome to Dr. Deirdre de Silva, whose topic will be maintaining comprehensive stroke unit care and post-discharge discharge care system. Deirdre de Silva is a consultant neurologist and head of neurology at the Singapore General Hospital, campus of the National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore. She's an associate professor with the Duke NUS Medical School, lead of the Singapore Ministry's Stroke Service Improvement Team, a board, me board member of the World Stroke Organization and a committee member of the local Singapore Stroke Support Organization, SNSA. We are very pleased to have you here. So over to you. Thank you very much. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Sendico and the World Stroke Academy for organizing this webinar and for the invitation to be involved. Uh, we, I know we have an audience from across Asia. Thank you for joining us and I hope everybody is keeping well and safe uh, during this particularly challenging time. Um, as a start, my disclaimer really is I'm no expert in this field. I think all of us are learning together as this crisis evolves and adapting along the way. There are new publications coming out every day. Um, and I, I looked at the literature and I will also be sharing how we've adapted our system here locally um, with regards to maintaining comprehensive stroke unit care and post-discharge um, planning. Um, there's been much discussion uh, even today on the hyper-acute stroke care with regards to the COVID pandemic, uh, but relatively less uh, discussing acute stroke unit management and post-care, uh, post-discharge care issues. Um, you know, IVTPA, endovascular treatment, acute stroke imaging are all really important, but we mustn't forget the bread and butter of stroke care in the stroke unit uh, and the care of our patients when they're discharged home. You know, we should remind ourselves that these components are really important. All our patients can universally benefit from this. There are no exclusion criteria, no inclusion criteria, no contraindications, and no serious risks involved. More importantly, we know that acute stroke unit has proven benefits in reducing mortality and disability and has long lasting effects. And we know when we care for our, post, our patients after discharge, we can improve their quality of life and ensure continuity of care. So we'll start by talking about the acute stroke unit care and how it currently is being disrupted by COVID-19. Firstly, you know, many hospitals may have their physical stroke units uh, removed because beds are needed for COVID patients or isolation beds, and therefore patients may be scattered across different wards. Even if you have your stroke unit intact, you will have stroke patients who are COVID positive and or suspected COVID and therefore are being cared for in the isolation wards. Stroke unit team members, staff members may be disbanded because they're deployed to cover emergency or isolation areas or some under quarantine. And the usual practice of the stroke team members often is we have face-to-face multi-D meetings and this is not possible now due to dis uh, distancing restrictions. Most of us use the stroke care pathway as the base and guide for our stroke unit care. And this may not be used outside the physical stroke unit and in, in addition, the stroke pathway is really designed um, to be used by staff who are trained and familiar with its use. 
And so staff who are not trained to use it and are caring for our stroke patients in isolation wards may have difficulty following this path. So we need to adapt as COVID um, evolves. Um, and as with the hyperacute stroke, and we've seen the protected stroke code guide uh, when we're attending to acute stroke patients in the ED, it is also important for us to adapt our care in the acute stroke unit to accommodate uh, the issues that, post, uh, that COVID poses to us. So when doing this, uh, our team at the Singapore General Hospital considered several uh, factors. We first identified what the key elements that had to be maintained. We tried to keep it simple with no detailed training needed to use this adapted pathway. We of course accounted for safety and infection control issues, and we considered manpower and resource constraint. We realized we couldn't have the optimal system that we had pre-COVID, and we had to make some compromises therefore. And we referred to this paper by Duffer, which and took advice from it about minimizing movement and to consider how the no visitor policy, which is implemented in many uh, hospitals, affects our patients. So together with uh, my colleague Ifan, who is a, a senior nurse and a physiotherapist, Shamala, we drafted this adapted ASU model for use in our hospital uh, for caring for patients who are outside our physical stroke unit and being cared by staff members who are not so familiar with looking after stroke patients. And the three big, big groups uh, components using the acronym ASU, so acute stroke monitoring, stroke complications, and a unified team. So as you can see, it's quite brief. It fits onto one page. Uh, the aim is that we can hand this to staff who are caring for stroke patients in isolation and not familiar with ASU care. And with a short briefing and some specific individualized instructions, most elements of the acute stroke unit can be managed and the COVID issues are also addressed as far as possible. So I'm going to just take you through this briefly. So for A, for acute monitoring, we have a simplified neuro observation uh, charting. Uh, we usually in our ASU, of course, would use the NIHSS, but training is required for proper use of NIHSS. So we instead use a simplified observation using conscious level charting and some key components of the NIHSS. And we do recognize that this is a compromise. We recommend that we don't use alone GCS, which is often what is used in most wards for neuro ops, as it um, has limited ability to detect neurological deterioration and stroke from published studies. So essentially, this is the charting system that we have. We have the Glasgow Coma Scale pupillary size and pupillary reaction as part of the conscious level charting. But we also have on the right, some elements of the NIHSS. You can see the instructions are there and these are elements which are actually rather self-explanatory and doesn't really need any specific training other than a brief um, initial briefing. Uh, and while it's not complete, it addresses most of the important neurological deficits in stroke. The other components uh, of the acute monitoring section were blood pressure, which we emphasize because we know it's very important in acute stroke, but you would have to advise on what is the target BP for that individual patient and the action needed to be taken, should it be too high or too low. We've included input and output charting. We have a point here on collating and rationalizing investigations. So if you can do a CTA and to include the neck arteries, then we could uh, avoid doing a carotid ultrasound and avoid sending the patient for a second investigation. We should try to arrange to move the patient as little as possible out of the ward. So we should collate any, for example, radiological investigations to be done at one go when the patient goes down to the x-ray department. For patients who are treated with TPA and EVT, obviously we would have to have specific individualized instructions for, for these patients uh, and these should be handed over to the team that is managing them. So the next big section is stroke complications and we emphasize VTE prophylaxis. Um, if the staff is not able to consider what are the indications, we recommend use of IPC for all patients unless it's contraindicated. We have emphasized again measures to prevent aspiration pneumonia should the usual screening for dysphagia not be able to carry it out. Um, then a speech therapist referral should be um, uh, put in for all patients. Obviously, we should take other measures um, in order to prevent aspiration pneumonia as well. Uh, we've put in that tubes should be minimized and removed as when they're not no longer needed. And we've addressed the immobility issues with advice on regular turning, use of pressure protectors and early mobilization. And lastly, that good nutrition should be maintained. And the final um, part of it is the unified team. 
So while the original stroke unit team may be disbanded, I think it's still important that we maintain the team-based care for stroke patients. So we've put in that there's daily check-ins with the isolation team, doctors and nurses, with the stroke team via telephone or video conferencing to allow for daily updates on the patient's condition and adjustment to the management plans. Patient education is particularly important as when patients get discharged now, they may have little follow-up due to COVID restrictions. So we should refer our patients to reliable websites and resources and give them hard copy education material, use videos where possible for family members and for caregiver training. Many hospitals have a no visitor policy now, and this is gonna affect our patients who may be even more depressed and feel abandoned. We need to assist them to ensure communication is facilitated with their loved ones. In addition, because of these restrictions, regular updates to the, between the healthcare teams and the family members and uh, caregivers need to be maintained. While it may not be possible to attend to every need for their discharge planning, we should have a system in place to identify what these needs are and so that we can address them at a later time if needed. And at the moment, we are giving each of our patient, uh, outpatient follow-up clinic in a multidisciplinary manner to ensure that all loose ends are tied up. And the final point here is with regards to support after discharge, uh, which we may often take for granted, but many of these support networks, um, such as the stroke support organizations, would have had to stop their activities due to COVID. However, we do know that some have started novel um, tele-befriending and support groups and programs online and if you do have this in place, uh, you should refer your patients to them. Post-discharge care is probably uh, equally being interrupted. Many countries are currently in lockdown mode with closure and limited access to many facilities. Outpatient and home-based care is mostly curtailed. And stroke patients being particularly vulnerable to COVID may default on appointments that are already being scheduled for them. And furthermore, usual exercise programs and access to good nutrition may be affected by the lockdown. Many appointments with doctors and therapists may be deferred and investigation wait times lengthen. And I'm particularly worried that our patients who run out of medication may be too worried to come or seek help to get top ups of their medication. And again, with regards to care and support, as mentioned earlier, most if not all physical centers are closed and programs halted. And so in addition to the usual psychological impact of stroke, our patients are now facing added anxiety and depression due to the impact of COVID. So we have some suggestions of how to address some of these issues and I've divided them into steps that we can take on discharge or when the patient is being discharged from hospital in this first slide and in the next slide when patients are actually at home. First, we should try to attend to most of their needs while they are an inpatient so that they can avoid unnecessary outpatient visits because we know that we don't want our patients to be coming up and down. We should provide our patients with uh, their loved ones with the information and access to the resources that they can use which are reliable and available in the language that they speak. We should give them contact information so that they know where to get help should they need it. And finally, the rehab needs should be assessed and documented so that um, team can see how best we can address these during these uh, particularly challenging times. While the patient is at home, we've also come up with some solutions to try to help our patients post-discharge. For rehab, if you have the availability of tele-rehabilitation or home exercise programs with guidance from videos, that can be used as alternatives to the usual face-to-face -face therapy. Many international rehab groups have developed resources um, and also from stroke organizations, which we can refer our patients to. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're giving our patients all an outpatient specialist appointment to ensure all issues are attended to and nothing has been missed out as a result of the COVID situation. We're working on home-based monitoring um, devices, you know, such as BP monitoring, apps to track movement and exercise, and apps to log in progress and to screen for complications using checklists. And lastly, we've arranged that for all of our patients, they get periodic telephone phone calls after discharge so we can see how they're coping and whether they've developed any unfortunate complications. So I have some final thoughts. I, you know, basically, I, I think that there has been a lot of emphasis on hyperacute stroke, which is very important, but we must remember not to neglect acute stroke unit care and post-discharge care during COVID. We will need to adapt. 
um, just as we are adapting for hyperacute stroke. And as Carol mentioned, um, you know, we're going to have to keep adapting based on the new issues that come up along the way. Some of these adapted processes may not be as ideal as pre-COVID, and there may be some compromises that we have to accept. Uh, and we need to work on these adapted processes because COVID is probably going to be with us for a long time. But I think the other thing that we should bear in mind is some of these adapted pr uh, processes actually may make us more efficient, may come up with more novel, innovative ways of care. And this may be an opportunity for us to have these novel um, care systems put into place and implemented. So um, with this, I end my talk. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, so <clears throat> while you've been talking, there have been a couple of questions coming in. Um, I think it's been really interesting. I think that last point you made, this has emerged with quite a lot of the discussions about um, COVID and stroke is that the the pandemic has really forced people to think about the most efficient way to operate and it, it's forced a lot of people to get out of their old habits and start thinking in new ways so i think you're absolutely right that the the introduction of these new methods will will carry over and will be um you know make stroke care more efficient in the in the future echoing what uh, jiraj has also said that these people have had to adopt new methods which i think is really great so one first question was from Dewi Kalista. Can we share the PDF materials uh, by e to email? Um, I think the short answer to that question is not quite, but what we can do, um, Alina, is can you just say a word about what exactly we'll do at the end of the, um, uh, of the webinar and where the materials will be placed? Yes, uh, so this session will be recorded and you'll find it on the WSO homepage as well as on the YouTube channel of the WSO. And as I said, we'll put all the resources and references on the homepage as well with links. Um, so you'll be able to download the material from there, the resources that are mentioned in the talks. Okay, and obviously if any of the speakers have any particular publications they want to bring yeah. to people's attentions or particular websites, so Carol, Deeraj and Deirdre, if you um, send the links to Alina, we can make sure those links are available um, uh, to, to, to people on the website. Um, and we did this previously with the, the, the first uh, Stroke and COVID webinar with Boo Norving and Marion Walker, uh, showing, ref uh, showing materials that were relevant to um, Europe. Uh, and obviously the materials you'll produce, you may, may send this will obviously be more relevant to Asia. So thank you very much for that. Um, the next question comes from Nina, which I think probably come, uh, will ask you, Deirdre, to respond to, but then I'll maybe get um, Deiraj to follow on. So um, Deirdre, the question was, our hospital has closed the rehab center. Which website and resources would you suggest for supporting patients? So I don't think that there is one particular website as, uh, as far as my um, initial discussions with um, my colleagues from the different therapy departments, uh, but I do know definitely the uh, physiotherapy, the World Physiotherapy Association has um, certain resources. Um, but I am mindful that we do need to make sure that these are in the appropriate languages that people speak. Uh, so we may need to adapt that or to have subtitles and such. Um, I can get the references from my therapy colleagues and um, share that with Alina. That would be really helpful. Thank you very much. So from Phil Bath to all patients. Um, so low molecular weight heparin is, in, is used in most medical patients, including those with viral infections. Um, so is, he's, uh, the, but we don't use low molecular weight heparin in acute stroke patients since any apparent benefit is undone by ble bleeding. I'm concerned that the COVID stroke literature is starting to suggest that COVID-19 patients should receive low molecular weight heparin. Um, he's making the point there's probably no special situation with COVID-19. Like other viruses, it can produce a prothrombotic and pro-coagulable state. Um, they're, they're, people talk about doing trials, but they need, the numbers need to be very large. So, um, Carol, any, any point, comments from you on the need for um, 
routine low molecular weight heparin therapy in COVID stroke? Yeah, I think from our experience um, here in Singapore, um, we haven't actually seen a, a large number of uh, patients uh, coming, coming in with um, stroke as the first presenting symptom of uh, COVID, uh, unlike uh, what was reported in, uh, in the US. Um, so, and we've, we haven't actually really seen uh, many of our COVID patients uh, developing strokes um, later on as well, um, even in the advanced stage of uh, the pneumonia. So I think at this point uh, of time, it's still too early to, to say that we should be using uh, low molecular weight heparin um, for COVID-19 patients. And um, I think um, the reports are all anecdotal so far, and I definitely agree um, we'll need large trials to, to support any uh, changes to our management. I, I would Can I just add? Okay. Sorry, Dheeraj. Yes, any comment from yeah, you? I, I, just, I just need to add a small uh, I think comment here regarding the uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin. Now, the only convincing thing which I, I could come across is this new autopsy study which said DVD is there. So in any case, even if DVD and thrombosis is happening, we do tend to give DVD prophylaxis for all strokes. It's standard, standard stroke limit here. If you're thrombolizing, started within 24 hours, what could possibly be done, which we're anyways doing with some cases of thrombectomy, we tend to start antithrombotics a bit earlier than 24 hours. And that's, we, we have data which says it's, it may not be that unsafe. So in any case, when you're starting low molecular weight heparin and in the prophylactic doses, I'm sure uh, what, what, what was being referred to as therapeutic, that should prevent a DED and should be safe for these patients. It was only probably uh, those patients who, who, I don't have the complete history of those patients, were they uh, on DVD prophylaxis? And it's mentioned in that paper that they're complete. It's not known whether DVD was even suspected in those patients, which underwent an autopsy in Germany. That's a German paper, by the way. I mean, I think that's, it's, I mean, it's been known for a long time that the, you know, in stroke patients, DVT often goes undetected, as does pulmonary embolism. So I'm not, I'm not sure that that adds a great deal to what we already know about symptomatic and asymptomatic th uh, thromboembolism in stroke. I think there's two things to say. Uh, firstly, that the discussion we had at the first COVID and stroke was that um, pretty much following what Phil Bartha said, that while there may be a theoretical uh, risk, the balance of evidence is you know, unclear the second thing is that there is a randomized trial now being started, which has just been um, uh, put up on um, clinicaltrials.gov, the PROTECT trial, which is examining the use of antithrombotics in patients who are stroke-free um, use of aspirin. So I think, um, so prophylactically giving aspirin to COVID patients in a, in a large-scale factorial randomized trial. So there's a trial going on in COVID, stroke-free COVID patients around the world. Um, and I would agree with Phil that at the moment, there isn't any real reason to change the, um, the guidance in guidelines for non-COVID non stroke patients. One last point is, Deirdre, you mentioned uh, IPC, so intermittent pneumatic compression. So which patients are you currently uh, putting intermittent pneumatic compression on in your stroke unit or passing through your hospital with strokes? So in the stroke unit, we have a nurse-led um, program for DVT prophylaxis. Um, and it's uh, patients are put on rest in bed or complete rest in bed if they have uh, lower limb weakness, which is um, not against gravity. Um, and there's no contraindication for IPC. Uh, we do put all our patients primarily on the intermittent pneumatic compression devices. Um, and we use that preferentially over the uh, low molecular weight heparin at prophylactic doses um, for our patients currently in the stroke unit per se. Um, and so we do have the provision of adequate devices um, within the hospitals. And that's why we are suggesting if the patients are in the isolation or uh, COVID positive patients that uh, we can use these devices as well. Okay, so some variation in practice around the world. Uh, um, but I think the, the evidence is certainly strongly in favour of intermittent pneumatic compression 
for patients who are bed bound with severe limb weakness. I would agree with that. Another thing that you um, mentioned, Deirdre, which I think is important, is the role of stroke support organisations. Uh, so in the UK, we've got the Stroke Association and in, in other countries. So first to Deirdre and then to um, Deiraj, um, what's your view about the role that stroke support organisations can play around the world during COVID in, in supporting patients once they get home? So I, I think one big way uh, with existing resources is the educational material. So I think if support organizations already have uh, good resources of educational material in local languages, um, that would be a very good um, tool for us to um, leverage on, uh, particularly during this time where education, usual education to patients may be not as ideal as during normal peacetime. Um, and that may be something that your local stroke support organization already has a website with resources and references that our patients and their caregivers can uh, refer to. I'm sure many stroke support organizations are in a, uh, also struggling with the COVID uh, and not being able to go to the offices and meet and such. And a lot of programs with SSOs are usually face-to-face, -face, whether befriending or support groups and um, group exercises and such. Uh, so I think they are also innovating and seeing how they can provide services to stroke the community um, during this time. So at least our local stroke support organization, the Singapore National Stroke Association has started um, tele-support groups. Um, they are different. Uh, you know, you do need people to log in in Zoom. It, it takes a little bit of um, getting used to. You usually has to be facilitated and moderated well. Uh, we have started uh, um, group exercises with a physiotherapist uh, and we are going to start soon mindfulness training uh, and we're hoping to do tele-befriending as well but uh, we haven't started that per se. But I think the SSOs are trying to be innovative uh, and to see how they can replicate what they usually do um, in these unusual times. Okay and we had a question along the same line from Sass Freeman in the UK. Um, so dealing with the role that support organizations can have. There's another question from Ajay Nayak, um, which I guess should really go to Carol Tam. For patients um, undergoing thrombectomy, is there a higher amount of clot burden in COVID stroke patients? Is that something you're aware of, Carol? Um, yeah, so, so again, um, in, in our population here, um, we don't seem to be seeing um, this phenomenon. Um, our the number of uh, stroke patients um, had acute stroke patients has not really risen, and um, the ones who do come in, uh, we don't see them having a higher amount of clot burden uh, compared to normal. Okay, so I think um, that's we've come up against the the time um, barrier. So we're an hour in. We've had 140 participants from around the world some great uh, talks and some interesting questions and discussions. So thank you um, to everybody. Um, and one other thing about rehab, simple new methods of rehab. Uh, last week we had the um, Take Charge presentation by Harry, um, Harry McNaughton of this very, very simple rehab um, intervention, which has remarkably powerful effects on long-term uh, disability after stroke. Uh, and I draw your attention to the, his recent paper in the um, International Journal of Stroke and the webinar, which is also on the um, uh, WSO website. So uh, please look at the resources that are on the WSO website. And I'd like to close by thanking Alina for being our very competent technical host and to all the speakers for some really great talk and a great discussion so thank you much to, very much to everybody and we'll close the call at that point thank you very much Bye.